Hi, I'm Zoe from Grenfell United. We've put this video together today to mark 52 months since the Grenfell Tower fire. We'll first hear from Pete Apps from Inside Housing, who will provide us with an update about where we are with the public inquiry. Yeah, OK, so Module 3 looked at basically the actions of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and the um, tenant management organisation and how well they'd lived up to their legal responsibilities in the years before Grenfell to ensure that the tower was safe and ensure that it was properly risk assessed and that they'd identified any people in the building that might be at particular risk and so on. There were a series of quite shocking revelations as a result of that work. We, we already knew that there weren't any personal emergency evacuation plans for disabled residents, but we saw email correspondence which showed that when the fire brigade asked if there were any disabled people in Grenfell, the, the, the risk assessor encouraged the, the TMO to say that there weren't. We also saw that we knew that the smoke ventilation system at Grenfell didn't work. We learned that it was left unfixed for six years, even though the TMO knew that there were issues with it. And uh, at one point during that process, when the head of health and safety at the TMO, Janice Ray, was asked about when it was going to be fixed, she replied to say, let us hope our luck holds and there isn't a fire. And there was also a lot of evidence about residents' complaints and how they weren't listened to and how the blog that um, Eddie Defarn and others were writing about, about the issues was, was not only not read by KCTMO, but blocked on their, their internal servers. And I think what came across was an organisation that, that, you know, in, in a number of quite key areas didn't meet its, its legal obligations and really, I think, didn't do enough to ensure that, that Grenfell Tower was, was a safe place to live. And, and, and that went beyond just cladding materials into various other areas, a pretty crucial one being fire doors. We, we also, at the end of Module 3, we then got closing statements for a different part of the inquiry, which looked at how the tower was refurbished and then how the cladding materials on the building were bought and sold. And a lot of that is about analysing how the construction industry in Britain works and uh, how people in the construction industry behave. Ten months ago, in our opening submissions for Module 2, on behalf of the Team 2 bereaved survivors and residents, we described the manufacturers Arconic, Kingspan and Salatex as crooks and killers. The evidence now having been heard tells us we were right. The manufacturers operated without any regard whatsoever for the lives of those living within walls covered in their combustible materials. Overall, these companies were committing wholly dangerous frauds. Kingspan, Salatex and Arconic saw high-rise buildings as high-rise additional cash just waiting to happen. What these companies were doing and being allowed to do was to wrap buildings housing families in the high-rise and high-tech equivalent of kindling soaked in petrol. It was a lethal combination. The evidence from all three companies showed no regard was given to the danger their products posed to the public. Nothing was allowed to stand in the way of market share. If there was a bad test, it was ignored and the next one rigged until the desired result was achieved. If they found data inconvenient, they simply hid it. If inconvenient questions were asked, they ignored them. It means that there was clear knowledge of the dangers posed by combustible materials being used on high-rise buildings within the manufacturers, the testing and certification bodies, and the government. A complacent civil service and the revolving door of ignorant ministers failed to appreciate the risks to life posed by dangerous cladding and failed to introduce any rigor to the regulatory process. We can all see the evidence which shows there are crooks who operated within the manufacturers and that at best and being generous, the certifiers and testers were negligent. But module two has also shown that a big part in this tragedy was played by the government who failed to operate any level of oversight of a poor regulatory regime and actively avoided regulation. Instead, they chose to trust industry well, look how that went. It had the effect of turning the crooks into killers responsible for the deaths of 72 men, women and children. The MHCLG has access to the same material we have. They can see the government's failings and they can see that the government failed to regulate. The MHCLG 
needs to wake up to its own responsibilities. I think that there was a lot of emphasis placed on getting a job done cheaply and finding the options that were cheapest. And that's something that we've known about since, you know, a few weeks after the fire, really. But I think it was, it was spelled out the extent to which saving money was made a priority and also the extent to which there was this huge chain of people involved in refurbishing the tower and making the key decisions about what materials to use and what safety checks to make and nobody ever felt like it was their responsibility to ask the question is this stuff safe and is this stuff legal they all allowed somebody else to have that responsibility or just assume that someone else would have that responsibility and the result really was that no one did. It's very difficult for me to make statements about who is and isn't criminally responsible but I think what we have seen is witnesses come to the inquiry and accept that their behaviour amounted to a fraud on the market and we've had expert evidence repeatedly say that people's actions did not meet the, the, the reasonable standards of competence within their profession. And all of that information is available to the Metropolitan Police and to the Crown Prosecution Service. And it's obviously hugely frustrating for the people involved to have to wait for so long to find out who's going to be prosecuted and if anyone's going to be prosecuted. And the inquiry's now moved on to look at the London Fire Brigade. It's then going to move on to look at the actions of central government. And of course, those are relevant. The actions of central government are relevant to the regulations that these people were following and so on. But it won't really change anything about the evidence we've heard in a substantial way. You know, the CPS is entitled to make whatever decision they want to make about whether that amounts to criminal conduct or not. I mean, we all know about the, the, the extent of dangerous cladding. ACM is still on buildings, especially on buildings of uh, medium rise, which, which can mean up to six storeys. Dozens of other different types of dangerous material, including the insulation types that are on Grenfell, are used all over the built environment. Um, but I think what's, what's as worrying for me is that we still place the same reliance as we did on the night of June the 14th on the stay put policy to keep people safe. We still don't develop emergency evacuation plans for, for, for people with disabilities. We still don't install fire alarms in, in, in buildings to warn people that there, there might be a need to escape. And so not only have we not remedied the defects in buildings, but we've also not done the work we need to ensure that the next tower will be safely evacuated if everything goes wrong. At the end of August, a building in Milan caught fire, flames broke out of a flat on the 15th floor and spread up and down the face of the building. Nobody died and essentially what happened was residents saw that there was a fire, they, they smelled the smoke, a lot of them, you know, there were balconies in that block and they had doors and windows open because it was 30 degrees and they realised there was a fire and they left and they, they, they walked downstairs that had no smoke in them and, and left the building and, and then when the Milan Fire Brigade arrived, they didn't try and fight the fire, they didn't actually try and put the fire out at all until the next day. They got a list of residents from the, the concierge on the front desk and they phoned everyone to make sure that everyone was out of the building and they went floor by floor and broke into rooms and, and, and made sure that, that, that everyone was out. And it does go to show that an aspect of making sure that these, these fires are at least low fatality events is getting everyone out of the building. And as I've been saying, that's not something we pay attention to very much in the UK. I think another point about Milan that I really want to emphasise is that the material on the outside of the building was ACM with a polyethylene core, bent into a cassette shape and hung on rails. And that is precisely the same cladding in the same shape as on Grenfell. And the shape's important because it's the shape that really makes this stuff dangerous. That to me begs the question, what did the company which sold that cladding do to find out where 
its product had been used, not just in the UK where we've had this process of looking for those buildings, but across Europe and across the world. Because fire doesn't stick to national borders. What has Arconic done to, 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 to figure out? It, we know from the inquiry it sold its cladding in Spain and in um, France and in the Middle East. And so has it gone to those people it sold it to and said, hey, this is the stuff that was on Grenfell, it needs to be taken off your building, or at very least you need to make sure that when a fire starts, the fire brigade know and the people that live in that building know, and what have the other ACM manufacturers done? Over the last few weeks, the, the inquiry turned to, to look at the London Fire Brigade, and obviously we heard a lot about the London Fire Brigade in the first phase, and there was criticism of them in the first phase report. What we've looked at over the last few weeks hasn't been what the London Fire Brigade did on the night of Grenfell, We've looked at what the London Fire Brigade did in the five or six years before. And I think what's really startling about that is the extent to which, at the higher levels of the organisation, there was an awareness that cladding was a problem and that large cladding fires could happen. The extent they, they warned central government, the commissioner of the London Fire Brigade in 2012 wrote a letter to central government warning specifically about cladding and building regulations and the danger for a fire. The question for the London Fire Brigade is why was that warning not disseminated to their own front line? And why did that awareness not change their policies in terms of dealing with one of these fires? And we all remember what Danny Cotton said in the first phase of the inquiry, which was this was like a space shuttle landing on the Shard. Now, I don't think the Fire Brigade wrote a letter to central government warning about a space shuttle landing on the Shard. What's really crucial about the phase one recommendations is, is this philosophy that you cannot know until a fire breaks out whether or not a building is going to be safe. You can't know that and therefore you have to have a plan B. Even if you're going to have stay put as your main normal procedure, you have to know what to do if things start going wrong and that means According to the phase one recommendations, developing plans for, to get people with disabilities out of the building. It means installing fire alarms that the brigade or fire service could use to alert people who are asleep, to get out of the block. And those things would save lives. I think, you know, it's gonna take fundamentally a long time to fix all of the buildings in Britain that are dangerous and that's ultimately a job that we will never finish. But what we can achieve is the ability to evacuate those buildings and get everyone out to safety if something does go wrong. And I find it shocking that even though we've put five billion pounds almost into removing cladding, it still isn't enough, but it's, 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 it's a large sum of money. We've put 30 million, which is in terms of government spending tiny, into fitting alarms and no money whatsoever into sprinklers and no money whatsoever into planning for, for, for the escape of disabled people. And, and that to me just is putting the priorities in the wrong place because you fundamentally, the important thing here is saving lives. And you know, you do that by getting people out of buildings and, and the government hasn't even finished their research into how to evacuate a building. And, and the, the first phase report was nearly two years ago now. I don't think the government has any claim, really, to, to, to say that they're implementing that report. Um, they're not implementing the, 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 the specifics of it and they're not implementing the philosophy of it. And I think that they, they, they should be held to account far more forcibly than they are um, for that failure. I think the thing is people sometimes talk about truth and justice and change as being things that are which one's more important than the other. And I think the way I look at it is that all of those three things are an expression of the same objective because you, you can't have truth until you can call people who committed criminal acts criminals and you can't say that until you've got justice and you probably won't get change until other people look at Grenfell and the people who were responsible for it and see that they were held to account for their actions. So you don't get truth or change without justice. There are so many people impacted by this across such a huge range of society and that includes people who live in the tower blocks that, that are in the news quite frequently now with, with dangerous cladding who can't sell and can't move on with their lives and are having, they, they, they feel that their lives are really taken away from them by the, the, the fact that 
they are, are facing the, these enormous and unpayable bills that, that will, I mean, you know, they're, they're bills that are going to destroy them. Um, and, you know, I spoke to somebody today about this who said that for the last three years, there hasn't been an hour where he hasn't thought about the, the cladding on the walls of his block. But it extends beyond that as well to people who live in buildings that might not have dangerous cladding, but, but do have a, a wide variety of other defects who, who know that they wouldn't be able to escape in a fire and who aren't being given the support to do so or the opportunity to move somewhere where it would be easier for them to get out. Um, and it extends probably as well to people who just live in housing that's, you know, that we've seen a lot in the news recently is, is just not maintained properly and not maintained in a way that's safe. I mean, I think the, the, the only way out of this issue in terms of the cladding scandal is for the government to grasp that nettle and say, we are going to decide directly which buildings need to be remediated and which don't. And then we are going to find a way to make those responsible for the ones that do need to be remediated pay. I, I, I kind of come back to what I said before actually on this, which is part of the, the reason is because we're sticking so tightly to the stay put policy and that demands zero risk because of its nature. Um, when if we were willing to think about evacuation as an option, as a default option in some of these buildings, the, the, the level to which they need to be remediated might change. We will now hear from Karim, who gave a speech at a rally that was organised by leaseholders. The first large rally that has been able to take place since lockdown. Hello everybody. Wow, there's a lot of people. <laughs> It's great to see so many people. Wow, this is incredible. Government, are you listening? Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Boris thinks he can reshuffle his, uh, his people, where to me, all that means he's trying to swerve, swerve the problems. But um, they don't know how stubborn and resilient we are. Anyways, look, I want to talk about Grenfell just quickly. That's really one of the main reasons why we're all here today. 72 members of our families were taken away from us because of a problem that they allowed to happen. And here we are four years later, still saying the same thing, chanting the same words. And it's painful, it hurts, it's frustrating. And the anger starts to seep through and the rage that you controlled all this time is starting to seep through. We're allowed to be angry. And the issue is we knew very quickly something very sinister was going on. Something wasn't right. And I think you all knew too. And we've had to listen to the slow and painful journey that the inquiry has taken us through, hearing about how corrupt and greedy these companies were. These companies that produced and manufactured these dangerous materials that are all across this country today. And you have to ask yourselves why. Why is it still four and a half years we're still talking about the same thing? Why is it that you have been left to suffer in your own homes, feeling powerlessness to a problem they've caused, and now you have to pay the bill? Why? Why four and a half years is still, this still happening? And I think I know why. Because of the cozy relationships these guys tend to have with these corporations, that's why. The donations and the gifts that some of these so-called honorable women and men listen to and take the advice from these companies. They allow them to create their own tests and they allow them to mark their own homeworks. That's why we're in the situation we are in today. Nothing's changed because they don't want to upset the ones that have been filling their pockets for decades. So we need to continue to be loud we need to continue to address this. We need to continue to talk about this. Hey, we might even need to regulate the lobbying industry. We can't continue to allow these cozy relationships with our leaders, our so-called leaders, to have with the ones responsible for killing our families. Four years and no one's been arrested. Are the crimes not obvious enough? Is the evidence not there? Like, I don't understand why it's taking so long. But I guess the longer I do this, I tend to understand that the system isn't broken. It was built this way. It was built to serve them and their mates, their lawyers and their bankers. That's what it was built to do. And you know what? They want us to roll over. They want us to die. They want us to go away. They want us to suffer with 
mental illnesses and they only want to talk about our trauma, well, you know what? We need to continue doing this. Be strong, be loud, be united. Look after your neighbors, look after your brothers and your sisters. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is not going to end tomorrow and it's not going to end next year either. It's going to take a very, very long time. So look after yourselves, look after each other because they think you're going to roll over and die. And I'm telling you something right now, that is not going to happen. We do, we want justice. We want justice for all of us. We want justice for our loved ones. I don't want my uncle, I don't want our families to be remembered for this culture of neglect. And I keep saying this, and I'll say it over and over again, they were left to die. They were murdered. Grenfell was no accident. Grenfell uncovered this national crisis. And unfortunately, this government isn't taking it serious enough. And this is why we need to still do what we do. This is why we need to keep gathering like this together. Keep banging on their doors. Keep making them see and remember who we are and what we stand for. I don't want to keep rambling on, but this is really important that they see the unity. And that's the only way that the change is going to come, by demanding it and demanding it together. Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now remember the 72 lives that we lost that night. Please join us in a 72 second silence. <laughs>